Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the aquarium. I want to welcome those of you who are in the auditorium as well as those who are watching online. If you're in the auditorium, please silence your cell phones or put them on vibrate and refrain from texting for the next hour. We have a wonderful story tonight, and you see it's based on this book, Overrun. It's much more than a fish story. <coughs> it is about the Asian carp, which was introduced into this country from Asia, and then it began to spread, and a lot of people got very afraid. There were plans to build electronic barriers across the a Chicago River so that it wouldn't get into the Great Lakes and other barricades. But it, as I say, it's much more than a fish story. And the author of this book and our speaker tonight is Andrew Reeves. Andrew is from Toronto, Canada. He lives in Toronto with his wife and two children. He got his bachelor's and his master's degree from the University of Toronto. He has master's degree is in human geography and then he got an MFA in creative nonfiction writing from the University of King's College in Halifax. He wrote first about energy, then about politics, and then the environment. And I, what's impressive, I think, is that he has consistently tackled timely and difficult problems to write about. He's an award-winning environmental journalist, and he is the editor-in-chief of Canada's oldest environmental publication, Alternatives Journal. And he's also published in, in many other journals. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Reeves. Hi, everyone. There we are. OK, everyone can hear me? We're, we're good to go? OK. Well, thank you so much, uh, first of all, to, to Jerry and to, and to Linda for inviting me here. Uh, it's an honor to be able to come down and speak at the aquarium. Uh, I, I will admit, when I was first invited, there was a part of me that was a little curious as to why uh, an aquarium in this part of the country would be interested in hosting someone who would be talking about an environmental issue that by and large has been confined to other parts of the country, the American South and the Midwest and the Great Lakes states. But uh, I'm very pleased to know that Jerry has been able to uh, identify something that I attempted to do with this book, which was to take some of the, these themes, these environmental themes, which we'll get to in the presentation, and realize that while they are most pressing in the South and the Midwest and the Great Lakes, that they are universal, uh, and they're something that I think that we'll be dealing with here as much as we will in other places uh, where I am from. So that's me. That's where you can find me if you want to find out more of the information uh, about my writing, uh, or get in touch with me with any questions afterwards, uh, see what I'm up to on Twitter. Um, so let's get started. It'll be difficult for me to see because of the lights, but show of hands, how many people have heard of Asian Carp? So there's some. If you've heard of Asian carp, it's entirely likely that this is what you're familiar with. You've seen pictures like this of these massive, massive fish. Or if you've seen them, you've also likely seen them like this. How many people are familiar with this image, these images of this fish? So these are silver carp. And they're leaping out of the water, and it's their fight or flight mechanism. Basically, they are small enough that when they hear the sounds of outboard motors like this, they take off. But what happens when you're traveling in a boat at around 20, 30 miles per hour, and you have a fish that weighs about 40 to 80 pounds that is flying at you in the other direction? And it was images like this that first really brought a, a broad attention to Asian carp. And it was one of the things that first really got me interested in this. But very quickly, what I realized is that when we're talking about Asian carp, it was really easy to think that this was all there was to the story. These comical flying fish. Go to YouTube, type in like silver carp, like flying Asian carp, and you'll see just hours and hours of video that's always really presented in this very comical sort of way of these fish jumping and can be funny. But really early on in the process, what I wanted to establish was that if we were going to be writing a book about this invasive species and the damage that they're causing, this was a serious story. And it has these humorous elements to it, but I wanted the story to move a little bit beyond that. So 
Well, I'll leave some of this up here. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, based on, uh, to build on the, the presentation or the introduction that Jerry gave. Um, so I'm an environmental reporter. I'm not a scientist. And so I had to identify really early on what exactly it was that I was gonna be bringing to this story that I wanted to investigate. And I realized that like, my passion uh, and my st strong suit was gonna be finding the right stories and asking the right questions and talking to the right people to be able to get to the bottom of it. And I was amazed when I first got into this story when I found out that, flash forward a few years, that the Army Corps of Engineers had been making this grandiose proposal to spend $18 billion to hydrologically separate the Great Lakes from the Mississippi Basin. And when I investigated, I thought that it was going to be about some central human need. Because normally when we're talking about spending billions and billions of dollars to do some major renovations of you know, watersheds, it's usually because we want to ensure that people have food or access to clean drinking water. But in this case, the rationale was to stop these four fish. So what are we looking at here? So Asian carp, I want to be really clear, is an umbrella term. We use this term to be able to describe what are these four fish in particular. And you have big head and silver and grass and black carp. They're four freshwater fish whose native range is northern China. You can see from the board, it was like the different times that they arrived from as early as 1963 to as recently as 1984. What's really important to know is that it's the way that these fish are going to work together in concert that makes them as a, as a species category so particularly alarming. Because when you put them all together is when they can do the most destructive damage. So grass carp moving forward, you'll want to remember all of this. Grass carp moving forward, they are uh, aquatic plant eaters. So if there are water weeds um, or like hydrilla, Eurasian water milfoil, these are the kinds of species that they are going to be targeting. Why are we worried about a grass carp? Because of their ability to destroy wetlands. So we're going to get back to this point later on. You just need to know it starting off. So you have silver and big head carp, which are filter feeders. So they're going to be moving through the water column, and they eat phyto and zooplankton. And the key issue here is that phyto and zooplankton basically form the cornerstone of the aquatic food web for the vast majority of freshwater fish in North America at some stage in their life cycle. And this is why we're worried about uh, big head and silver carp. And black carp are on a different invasion trajectory, uh, but they eat freshwater mussels and clams, which and freshwater mussels in North America are one of the most endangered uh, subsets of species that we have. Where are they? Mostly in North America, if we're talking about where exactly they are, it was like you can see the, the pattern here. This is for grass carp, to be clear. But based on where we are in the country, it was like they are on the West Coast. But why, why do we think that this area here in particular is as colored as it is? Well, because this is the Mississippi Waterway. And their introduction point here in Arkansas, which we're going to get to in a second, it's like this was their entry point. And it was from there, it was like that they managed to spread on their own and with our help thousands and thousands of miles south to the Gulf of Mexico, where they have shown an alarming propensity to be able to survive in saltwater despite being a freshwater species. Most of their introduction here in Florida was introduced by humans, it was like, but most of this spread has been on their own. So today, I want to talk with you a little bit about Asian, how Asian carp arrived here in North America. Because the story that we often hear isn't necessarily a lie, but it's dangerously thin. And here goes. The media has, over the past several decades, when we've talked about Asian carp, we have largely told ourselves that this was a problem with ignorant fish farmers who introduced these species in the 1960s and into the 1970s with no regard for the natural environment, that we brought them in, and then through flooding, they were able to escape up into the 80s and the in the early 90s. It's not entirely untrue, but what I found when I started digging into this story is, as I mentioned here, it, it's dangerously thin. And again, as I mentioned, if the Army Corps was going to be asking us to spend $18 billion to be able to do something about this problem, or if the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative was going to be funded for $300 million every year, largely to deal with issues like Asian carp, we, as a society, both here in America and even in Canada, where we are also spending tens of millions of dollars to deal with Asian carp, I felt that we needed to have a much stronger understanding of how exactly it was that these fish got here. If someone comes to you, if a friend comes to you and asks for, to borrow money, chances are you're probably going to ask why. And if they say, well, because, you're probably going to want to know a little bit more than that. 
And while with Asian carp we have seen that there have been a number of magazine articles, there's been a lot of news coverage about them, what I noticed really early on is that there was no comprehensive story that really tried to look at how it is that they got here and what the economic, the, the social, uh, and the historical implications of that introduction have been. And so that's what Overrun is. I started writing this in January of 2014. It was about four and a half, five years of research and writing. The book's been out for just under a year. And I have found that as the more places that I've traveled to, it's this introduction, it's this history that people tend to be um, um, the most ignorant of in a lot of ways. And so this is really what I want to focus on because as I say here, I actually think that the truth behind this is so much more fascinating than that narrative that we've told ourselves. So, the story of Asian carp is like actually has a, a much more fascinating story and the root to this comes from Silent Spring. People here familiar with Silent Spring? Pretty seminal text. One of the most fascinating things that it did really early on was it created this idea Hmm. That's not working for me, but that's all right. I'm going to plow ahead. Silent Spring, as I like to say, basically uh, created this idea that it presented to people, which was what we had done for so long, this spraying of chemical pesticides, that it was an incredibly silly idea because we were so short-sighted in thinking about the ramifications of, the chem of what spraying these pesticides was going to do. So... Remember that this was the time of DuPont's like better living through chemistry. This was the idea that DDT, which had come back from World War II, given a hero's welcome, that it was actually going to be able to revolutionize was like how it was that we lived our lives. That chemistry and the spraying of pesticides was going to be able to clear our waterways of like invasive weeds and it was going to be able to uh, rid pantries of bugs. So there were all of these really interesting narratives at the time that DDT was going to become every housewife's best friend to be able to rid her pantry of bugs. It was treated as a hero when it came back. And so you would see stories like this. And then you have images like this of kids that are gathered at a pool, and you have someone who has a sprayer here who is basically just lousing all of these children in DDT. And it's fascinating, when I met my wife, uh, when I met her mother for the first time, she grew up in a small town in Nova Scotia. One of the first stories she told me was uh, how her and her older brother actually would ride their bikes behind the DDT truck as it drove down Maiden Street with sprayers just like this, creating like a chemical cloud to be able to de-louse uh, the entire community. And that this was pretty common but we didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about what the implications of this were going to be. And so what we ended up finding in this way was the way that uh, DDT was going to bioaccumulate and it was going to move up the food chain. And so this is what we end up finding, that Rachel Carson was the first one to really put forward this idea that the indiscriminate spraying of these chemical pesticides was like, wasn't an isolated incident and that it was slowly working its way up and that not only was it killing birds and fish and reptiles, but that it was ultimately going to be killing us, which we found eventually when we were able to discover that DDT was showing up in the breast milk of, of uh, new mothers uh, throughout North America uh, and indeed around the world, that DDT had this global spread and that it sticks around for a very, very long time. So one of the fascinating things that came out of Rachel Carson's book was this idea that nature and the problems that it creates tends to find its own way to be able to deal with a lot of those, those concerns. If we listen to nature, it will end up dealing with this problem quite effectively. So she had proposed something called biological control. And she had put this idea out there as a potential solution to some of the problems that we were encountering. And she really wanted people to be able to understand that it wasn't necessarily pesticides themselves that were the problem, but it was this pervasive way of thinking that we could just spray our way to salvation that she had a problem with. And this is what she was identifying. But in putting out this idea of biological control, something really fascinating happened. Resource officials, and men like this man, Jim Malone, who was a fish farmer from Lone Oak, Arkansas, took up this idea that there had to be 
a better way to be able to deal with this problem. And one of the things that I found so fascinating through this research process, what came out of this talk, was the idea that there could be solutions uh, beyond this chemical spraying. And so in early 1960s, in Lowen Oak, Arkansas, there was a meeting of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they got together with some members of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, but they also got together with members from the United Nations and from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization who got together and they said, so we understand that you're looking for biological solutions to be able to control your aquatic weeds. And to be clear, when we talk about aquatic weeds, I want to, be, I want to make sure that people don't think that this was just weeds that were clogging up the bo local boat ramps or at the cottage. Um, aquatic weeds at this time, especially here in states like Florida and in California specifically, they were causing tens of millions of dollars in damages every single year because these were aquatic weeds that were very, very fast reproducing. They were clogging irrigation ditches and um, irrigation ditches were central to citrus groves here in California and in Florida as well. And they were costing farmers hundreds of dollars like per uh, mile to be able to dredge out these weeds. And if you had a big, massive operation, you couldn't afford to continue uh, dealing with weeds by dredging. You didn't want to spray chemicals anymore because not only was it incredibly expensive, but we also knew the damage that it was causing. So when someone from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization came along in the early 1960s and suggested to a lot of these men who were working in resource, uh, as resource officials at the time, and he said, you know, there's actually a fish called grass carp, also known as white amur for the Amur River region in China and northern Russia where it's native that is the most prolific aquatic weed eater that you can imagine. And it's very, very hardy, and it should sur survive here, no problem. Maybe you want to take a look at whether this fish would actually be able to help deal with your aquatic weed problem. But the man from the, from the UN did leave his US resource officials with a warning. He said, before you move forward with this, think on it. Do your homework, really determine whether this is a fish that you want to introduce because we know that when species are introduced, they can be very difficult to control. How long do you think the resource officials took to think about it? About a month. And they determined in that month, or so they thought, that there were no, no problems whatsoever with introducing this fish. And so it was given to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Experimental Research, Research Station in Stuttgart, Arkansas. And they were given some of these fish to be able to deal with. And so suddenly their first problem was not what impact might these fish have in the wild. Their first concern was actually a purely commercial one. How do we spawn enough of these fish that we are actually able to see whether we can grow them to a point where we will be able to utilize them or we'll be able to sell them to um, people who are like farmers who need them to clear irrigation canals or people who run golf courses who need them to clear golf course ponds or municipalities that were running uh, hydroelectric projects who needed these fish to be able to keep their lagoons clean. So it was a commercial enterprise were the first questions. But then you also had private players like Jim Malone, who also saw this as an opportunity. But it wasn't, Jim Malone wasn't on his own. He was all, there were also uh, universities, like Auburn in particular, that really started getting into the, the fish spawning game to be able to see, can we grow enough of these? But Jim was a really interesting case. I flew down to Little Rock, Arkansas, to spend a few days in the archives at the University of Central Arkansas. Jim became one of the, the most well-known uh, defenders uh, of grass carp over the many decades that he spent time with them. And this is one of the photos that came out of the, uh, the archives here. This is Jim's father. And this is an experiment, this is a fee fishing lake that they were creating here on property that his father purchased. The idea was they wanted to build a lake where they would be able to charge people to come in and fish, but the idea never really took off. So they had this land and he didn't really know what to do with it, so he gave the land to his son, Jim, and Jim turned to rice production. But then, interestingly enough, in a way these stories are all connected, a few years into his rice production in the 1960s, a, a low-flying airplane that was spraying chemical pesticides, of all things, actually decimated his rice crop. And he was really frustrated because all of his money that he invested in this rice crop was now gone. But around that time was when grass carp had first been brought to North America in the mid-1960s. And he thought maybe there was an opportunity while he was regrowing his rice crop to be able to keep some of these fish in a pond in the middle of his property just to see whether the idea took off. 
And here's some pictures from their properties that came out of the archives to give you a sense of what this looks like. I visited this space as well. It's still in operation. It doesn't look much different now than it did in the early 1960s and the 1970s. And one of the remarkable things as a researcher is when you spend time in the, the archives and you find something like this and you feel as if you're actually holding a piece of history in your hand. This is the original packing slip uh, that Jim Malone filled out to be able to send away to Taipei in order to be able to order 5,000 uh, white, uh, white uh, grass carp, also known as white amber. But this was also the first purchase, the first private purchase of silver and big head carp in North American history. And this arrived on Flying Tiger Airlines at the Little Rock Airport in a, uh, August of 1972. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I want to talk about grass carp. Because Asian carp right now, their name is effectively mud. You find very few supporters of this species that we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to eradicate. But this was not that long ago that you had stories that were appearing in reputable newspapers. And I love this image. It was like the Superman's crest and cape. Superfish. No bird or plane. It's a white amber. I love this headline. It was like, the red snapper has no equal as for uh, catching, right? Wrong. There's no fish trickier to catch than trout, right? Wrong. No fish can hurl himself through the air like the mighty tarpon, right? Wrong. What's this? There are more fish adept at doing these things than the snapper, trout, and the tarpon? Wrong. They tried to get people really jazzed about this fish because it was so incredible at removing aquatic weeds. But the problem was, and it only became a problem later on, was we got so good at spawning these fish that initially, as I mentioned, our concern was, will we be able to spawn them in lab? Will we be able to create enough of them to be able to sell to people who are interested in purchasing them? That's why Auburn University got involved as well. And they developed this arms race between Fish and Wildlife Service and Auburn University as they attempted to outduel each other to spawn more of these fish. But initially, what ended up happening was by uh, 1971, Auburn had gotten so good at spawning these that in a single go, they had about 100,000 uh, viable fertile grass carp fry. But what do you do with 100,000 fish? And the reality was is that we had some idea for it, but there really wasn't the market that we had fully developed. And Auburn didn't really know yet what they were going to do with it. So according to the historical record that I and others uncovered, Auburn basically gave these fish away to, quote, persons unknown. So lax were the biological um, you know, security protocols that were in place that they simply grew too many of these fish and they didn't know what to do with them. There was a man I met in my research travels in Arkansas who told me that the, the actual historical literature doesn't even adequately reflect just how lax the protocols were. They grew so many of these fish so quickly that the, the, the raceways, they called them, these little concrete tanks that they kept the fish in, were actually so full to bursting that they overflowed the tanks. And then, well, what happened to the fish that was like that flopped out onto the floor? Well, actually, they were just ferried towards these saran screens. And basically, what they ended up doing was they would essentially just lift up the screen and flush the fish out to local bayous. But where did those bayous flow to? Local streams. And where did the streams run to? Local rivers. And where did those rivers run to? Bigger rivers. Where did those rivers run to? The sea or the Great Lakes, depending on where you are. And so when we think about how it was that these fish ended up spreading as dramatically as we have, if you remember the map I had up earlier, this is how it happened. It happened through well-intentioned people who had peer-reviewed science behind them and recommendations from the United Nations that these fish are going to allow you to be able to realize Rachel Carson's biggest dream of using biological control methods instead of chemical spraying to be able to deal with the problems that we face every single day. But eventually, after we stopped worrying about their commercial capabilities, we started seeing stories like this appear. Readers are disagreeing about grass carp, a controversial biological control. Suddenly, newspaper articles began reporting what they should have been reporting right from the beginning, which was they were spending time now thinking about, wait, these fish, which have now been swimming freely in waters in Arkansas, at least, um, since the mid-1960s, what impact were they going to have? And what happens to fish that we release in Arkansas when there are open rivers in Arkansas that flow to the Mississippi, which flows to a vast swaths of the US South and the Midwest and the Great Lakes? Where are those fish going to go? What impact are they going to have? And while men like Malone and many others like him early on said, 
They're not a problem. They haven't overrun organization or uh, rivers in China. You don't have to worry about it. They're going to be able to find like their own special niche here, and they're not going to be a problem. They might not be even be able to spawn. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. We've been able to raise them in lab, but that's not to say that they'd be able to find the exact circumstances that they would need in order to be able to respond in the wild. It was hopeful thinking, and it proved to be dramatically false. So what I want to do, yeah. Sorry, nature's weed eater. Grass carp a curse, or is it a cure-all? So I want to leave that up for a second while I do just a really quick reading, just to give you a sense of the book itself, um, but also just the, the way in which I tried to take this, um, some of this research and some of this science and really bring it to life. To say a little bit about the book before I dive into it, um, I am a uh, uh, narrator in the book, for lack of a better term. I really thought long and hard about whether I wanted to be a character in the book. Initially, I didn't want to. But this issue takes place over such a big geographic area and over so many decades that there were no other characters, I felt, that were really able to be there from the beginning until the present day. Uh, so I pop in uh, as a book of nonfiction. I also wanted to be able to write for the senses. It was really important to me to have readers be able to understand that when I was out on a boat with commercial fishermen and was covered in fish blood and guts and feces, I wanted to be able to write what that looked like, what it felt like, what it smelled like. When I visited a fish farming plant in Thompson, Illinois, and felt that the overwhelming stench of fertile, liquid, liquefied fish was going to make me throw up on a research uh, source that I was talking to, I wanted to be able to include that because I thought it wouldn't necessarily be true to the audience to really get a sense of what this story is like if I didn't talk about how when I was interviewing someone I thought, I need to start taking some steps backwards because if I don't, I could throw up on this person. And I think this was the kind of color that I really wanted to be able to add to the story. So what I'm going to read from here is a meeting that I had after I had met up with one man who worked for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission who is now currently a fish producer in Arkansas, a man named Mike Fries. Um, and I had also just finished speaking with another man um, named uh, Drew Mitchell, who had spent his entire life uh, working with Fish and Wildlife Service, also raising grass carp, and then later uh, working with um, for, uh, producers to be able to determine whether the fish were, were fertile uh, later on. And this comes about when I had first heard the idea that Rachel Carson played a role in this story, when it was suggested to me for the first time. And I didn't much believe it, but I wanted to go back in my notes to explore it just because it was one of those issues that was sort of nagging at me. <clears throat> As our meeting concluded, Mike Fries handed me a water-stained banker's box, overflowing with musty fish reports, files, and photos dating back to the 1960s. That night, I dissected the documents, flicking away the exoskeletons of long dead beetles trapped between Arkansas Game and Fish Commission reports. Suddenly, it occurred to me why talk of Rachel Carson had stuck in my throat. Freeze wasn't the first to invoke Silent Spring. Drew Mitchell had told me much the same. I flipped back and reviewed my interview notes. Mitchell, throughout the 1940s and 50s, there was tremendous chemical usage, DDT being the poster child. And then there became many scares in the public, and people became very concerned about it biologically. A book arose from this that's really a trendsetter, a wonderfully written book by Rachel Carson. She suggests the use of biological control to get away from chemical controls, even the importation of biological controls. Whatever we can do to lower chemical usage. This was a huge trend. Her book came out in 1962, and in 1963, grass carp was first brought in by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Me, wait, was this actually a driving force behind their decision? Mitchell, absolutely. Because some people say, well, US Fish and Wildlife Service was really screwed up, but no. They were following what they thought was good, appropriate, sound science. Concern over chemicals so far outweighed that they didn't even worry about it. Fish and wildlife were dealing with how do we lower chemical use? And these grass carp, they gave them something. The impact of Silent Spring in creating a social mindset where importing an exotic fish for biological control of aquatic weeds seemed rational is often overlooked in Asian Carp's American Odyssey. Despite its current iteration as a harbinger of ecological doom, invasive carp fit snugly into an environmental ethos that evolved throughout the 1960s, turning a blind eye to the high cost of prolonged chemical use both economic and environmental, became increasingly arduous after Carson exposed the chemical industrial complex's dark underbelly. Using grass carp was a compelling new course of action. As Mitchell told me, these grass carp, they gave them something. <clears throat> 
And while the public fixated on chemical reduction as the lasting message of Silent Spring, a small contingent of fisheries researchers glommed onto the idea of turning to nature for solutions to pests. Biological control has achieved some of its most spectacular successes in the areas of curbing unwanted vegetation, Carson had written. Nature herself has met many of the problems that now beset us, and she has usually solved them in her own successful way. Inspired, curious wildlife officials went searching for biological solutions. So, before we dive into that, we have a few detours that we need to make to bring it all together, which was basically, if you haven't gotten it at this point, it was like, that was the, sort of the interesting process of writing over one, was thinking that I was setting out to write this story about this fish and realizing very early on in the process that in order to really be able to tell this story and to have it make sense, there were so many rabbit holes that I needed to dive down. And some of them made it into the book and some of them didn't prove as fruitful as I'd hoped, but that's just the process of researching and writing. The idea is you find enough of them that keep you excited and that actually help drive that narrative forward. And this is one of those fun detours. Uh, this is a man named Homer Buck. And this was something about, there was a story about catfish farming uh, that played a really interesting role in the future of Asian carp in North America. So this man, uh, Homer Buck, he worked for the Illinois Natural History Survey. And can anyone see, you may be able to see, what is he standing in front of? I think I heard someone say it. Say it louder. Pigs. He is standing in front of pigs. And the interesting thing about this contraption that they'd built in, this is in Kinmundi, Illinois, um, is this contraption is over, is over a, a pond here in the background. And so the idea at the time was that in the 1960s into the 1980s, what is, how this all come together is that catfish farming had actually taken off. And in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, it had become big business. And it had um, been employed by the mid-1980s about 6,000 people, and it was worth, I believe, about $8.5 billion. But the problem was, in order to grow catfish, they needed an incredibly like, high protein feed. And part of the issue was, was that they pooped out just these huge just volumes of, of feces that ended up causing algal blooms in a lot of the ponds. And so what they were trying to figure out here as well was, could you raise hogs on nothing, uh, or sorry, could you raise um, Asian carp back here on nothing but hog manure and sunshine? And the answer was yes. And this then led the way for thinking, OK, well, if you stocked this pond here with silver and big head carp, who are filter feeders that are going to swim through the water body, and they're just going to be eating whatever organic material happens to be there, if those fish can survive eating nothing but hog manure, then chances are actually pretty good that they would also be able to survive eating nothing but the waste left over from catfish. So what ended up happening was uh, um, Homer Buck here became close friends with uh, Jim Malone. They developed a correspondence. They shared best practices and research stories. And it was through Homer Buck that Jim Malone first found out about two other fish alongside grass carp that were actually cultured beside them in China to great effect. Because remember I mentioned that they all do different things, and it's only when together that their strengths become so terrifying. So it was first presented by Homer Buck to Jim Malone that there's actually silver and big head carp. And there are these two fish that are grown alongside them in China that when you culture them all together, are tremendously successful at being able to clean out um, algal blooms and to eat up all of the algae in ponds. And so what was first proposed then was maybe we can actually culture Asian carp, especially specifically big heads and silvers, alongside catfish. So remember that uh, packing slip that I showed you earlier from Jim Malone. In addition to the 50,000 grass carp fry that he purchased, he also purchased 10,000 silver carp, which, as I mentioned, was the first private purchase of silver carp in North American history. And specifically, he was bringing those fish over to be able to breed more of them, with the idea being that maybe here was this business opportunity to be able to sell these big head and silver carp to catfish farmers. Well, there's a reason that you've probably never heard about this as a way of dealing with catfish farming. And the simple answer is because while the fish were really good at doing what they were brought over to do, which is eating all of the waste generated by the catfish, which was the fish that people actually wanted to buy and eat, the big head and silver carp, which can grow to sizes typically about like 50, 60, but up to 140 pounds in some instances, 
they grew so much larger than the catfish that when it came time to harvest them, the people who were growing catfish basically said, we don't want to work with these because the fish were growing so large that they were thrashing so violently when you pulled them out of the water that one of two things was happening. They were either injuring the workers who were attempting to haul the fish out of the ponds, or they were actually thrashing so wildly that they killed the catfish. So it didn't really endear them to catfish farmers who experimented with this for a few years before they basically told producers like Malone and Auburn University and Fish and Wildlife Service that they weren't interested. And so now all of a sudden you have this interesting situation because you have private players, universities, and the federal government who have been investing time and money now over the early 1970s into raising big head and silver carp. And so suddenly they're left holding the bag, thinking like, well, what do we do with these things? We brought them over to solve this catfish problem. And it did, but then it created this whole other set of problems. So what do we do? We don't want to walk away from this. We're in for a dime, so we have to be in for a dollar. But then something remarkable happened. In 1972, the Clean Water Act became law. And the amazing thing is there were a number of people who I spoke with in Arkansas when I was doing research for this book who talked about this um, as if there was this moment before the Clean Water Act and this moment after the Clean Water Act. And it was sort of put to me that before the Clean Water Act came into effect, what did we do with all of our sewage and all of our waste? Well, in a lot of cases, we simply just dumped it into whatever poor water body happened to be nearby, and we assumed that it was going to dilute itself enough, it was like that it wouldn't be a problem. Maybe we strained out the solids, maybe, not always, and we would basically just like let it flow by. The Clean Water Act basically said that this not only had a tremendous impact on those natural waterways, but that it was also a ridiculously silly idea. And so the Clean Water Act came along and said to small counties, through, like you know, small governments throughout the states, you can't just strain out the solids and dump raw sewage into the rivers anymore. But if you're a small county, like in Arkansas, where there were many of them and still are, and all of a sudden a federal regulation comes down that says, this thing that you've been doing forever, you can't do it anymore. And we're going to give you a few years to be able to implement new solutions. And if you don't, then we start fining. And the fine at the time, I was told, was about $25,000 a day. So you had some of those governments that started scrambling, thinking, what are we going to do about this problem? We can't face these EPA fines. So how are we going to get around this? So. That's where this man comes in. This is Scott Henderson, who I had uh, the, the pleasure of being able to speak with. He is still around uh, and what, gave me a wonderful interview um, to sort of fill in some of the details that I had found, some of the gaps in the historical record. Few people wanted to believe it at the time, but the, the documents still exist, and I and other researchers found them. Then in the early 1970s, the Environmental Protection Area started talking to small local governments around the country who were worried about the Clean Water Act, and they said, well, you know, there's these fish, and they've been cultured in China to great effect alongside grass carp, and they do exactly what you need them to do. And so if you build sewage lagoons where you store your waste through the process of anaerobic digestion, you can stock your lagoons with silver and big head carp, and they will clean them out and it will save you an obscene amount of money, and it's a biological control option. It is better than simply dumping it out, and it's better than chemical treatment, and it's also far cheaper. But the problem was, was that the EPA was building on a report that was done by the University of uh, Oklahoma in 1976 that said this ideal will work. And they believed it, but they didn't really have the studies to be able to prove it. And so the EPA did what they do, which was they contracted with a local agency to be able to do that science. And this man, Scott Henderson, was a rookie fishery biologist in the mid-1970s who received $90,000 from the US Environmental Protection Agency to study whether big head and silver carp as stocked in sewage lagoons would be able to clean that problem, or to clean those lagoons and deal with that problem. And then here's this, one of this, the remarkable details you find. Uh, Scott Henderson also realized that there might also be a really tremendous opportunity with these fish as well for a lot of those county governments. Big head and silver carp, though we don't really spend a lot of time eating them here in North America, are a, a common delicacy. It was like in their native range where the culture around eating fish is to be presented with a head-on, bone-in, whole fish 
rather than the way we consume fish here in North America, which tends to be as like a boneless filet or mashed up and deep fried. So he thought, well, wait a minute. There are a lot of people who might want to eat this fish as well. What if we take the fish that we've been raising in sewage lagoons, eating nothing but human waste, can we eat those? Can we sell them to producers who would turn them into food that humans would actually want to eat? Would they be so polluted with toxins from eating nothing but human sewage or human waste that like, could we even eat them without getting terrifically sick? So he wrote to the National Fisheries Branch in Washington and received about $18,000 to tack on to his EPA study just to be able to see. While we're seeing whether these fish can clone this, these sewage lagoons, why don't we see whether they can actually be healthy and tasty and you know, <laughs> not poisonous if we actually want to eat them? So in the, early, or the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, Scott Henderson uh, organized him, uh, an experiment at, the university, or at a, a hospital site in Benton, Arkansas, with two sewage lagoons that he stocked with big head and silver carp that he had gotten from local producers. And he spent a couple years working on this issue and found, not even necessarily to his amazement, he was a scientist and he thought this was going to work out, and it did. Nitrogen and phosphorus were reduced by about 90%. Fecal coliform levels dropped 2.6 fold. And then when he analyzed the fish to be able to see whether they were so contaminated with toxins that they couldn't be edible, and he found out actually that surprisingly, things like mercury didn't really show up in the fish in the way that we thought they would, and that they were actually really healthy for us to eat. He did some back of the napkin calculations and found that if county governments bought these fish, raised them to a decent size, it was like, well, they all like on nothing but human waste, and then sold them to local producers, that these local county governments would actually be able to make money from stocking silver carp. It would go from being fined $25,000 a day by the EPA if they didn't have a plan in place to you can actually make 1100 bucks like on the sale of these fish, provided that someone actually wants to eat them. So these are some of the reports that I found that sort of uh, identify, like the, these are the annual reports that Scott Henderson put together for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission as a result of their research that they were doing on what was called the Chinese carps and their polyculture study. So he wrote all of this up, and in about 19, or 1982, he took all of his findings and he, e he mailed them in, I was gonna say emailed, he mailed them in to Washington, to the EPA, saying, we have the results that you were looking for. What you've been telling people is true. We can go ahead with this. We can put those producers to work, raising more of these fish. We can sell them to county governments. They're gonna be able to do everything we want, and if we can convince people to eat them, it's actually a source of revenue. For, for people like Henderson, this was a win-win-win. But in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and he had a much different outlook towards environmental matters than his predecessor, Jimmy Carter, did. And famously, um, one of the first appointments that Reagan made was appointing Ann Gorsuch, who is the mother of your new Supreme Court Justice, Neil Gorsuch, to head the EPA. And to, in tandem, both of them started boasting about the damage, essentially, that they were going to do the, to the Environmental Protection Agency in terms of shrinking its budget and in shrinking the book of regulations. I think Ann Gorsuch had said that famously that she was gonna shrink it from about six inches down to one uh, inch of all of the EPA regulations. And so it was around this time that Scott Henderson was working on his studies. He sent those reports in to Washington, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he heard no reply. And then one day he called them to say, I sent you this, this amazing report What's going on with this? And the response that he got was that the political winds had shifted and that they were no longer interested in funding the kind of work that he did. And he was told that he should essentially wrap up the work that he was doing in Benton. They thanked him for his work and told him that there would be no more money coming and that there would be no more interest in doing research with Big Head and Silver Carp to control uh, sewage problems. And he was stunned. Today, to this day, when I spoke with him, he still seemed sort of wistful, almost, that this idea, which showed so much promise, came to naught. But he did as he was told. He went back, he drained the ponds, he limed them, he killed all of the fish that were in the ponds. But while Scott Henderson was diligent in making sure that he destroyed all of the fish that he had in his experiments, it sent this chilling ripple effect through the aquaculture community. Because everyone heard about this, and everyone heard that suddenly, 
all of these people who were working on raising these fish and doing research with them was thinking that there was going to be a commercial application. Suddenly, with the EPA's uh, killing of the report, now you had nothing to do with these fish. And so private players like Malone and Auburn University and Fish and Wildlife Service were stuck with tens of thousands of big head and silver carp that they had brought to the country and raised that they didn't really know what to do with anymore. And so while Scott Henderson was diligent in destroying his research species, not everyone showed that same level of enthusiasm for abiding by the rules and properly destroying any research fish that they were working with, especially when it was so much easier when your facilities were connected to local streams to, as I mentioned earlier, simply open up those saran screens that allowed the water but not the fish to pass through, to open up those screens and to let the fish make their way to those local bayous, to local streams, to local rivers, to big rivers. So, in a nutshell, that's how, where we find ourselves now. The rest essentially is history. Talking with Scott Henderson, he told me that after that, there was never another use for big head and silver carp really in any sense. Interestingly enough, you go back and look, let's see if I can head back for a second. You go back and look at these uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission reports. And from the early late 1970s into the early 1980s, what you find is that all of these reports would contain um, re um, catch data on what local fishermen were catching um, at um, like local landings and what they were reporting to the government that they had caught. And in the late 1970s, you didn't see any Asian carp species listed. And then all of a sudden, in around 1978, you saw the first listing for grass carp. And then that number started to grow and grow. And then by the early 1980s, you saw silver carp listed for the first time. And then you saw those numbers begin to grow and grow. And right around the time, shortly after Scott Henderson's project was wrapped up, and maybe around 1982, you had commercial fishermen who were suddenly were reporting not only grass and silver, but also big head carp in increasingly large numbers. And Arkansas took a lot of heat later on, but really faced no consequences for the fact that it was their um, local agency that made the executive decision to start stocking local ponds and rivers in Arkansas with these fish with zero consideration for the fact that most of Arkansas's waterways are connected to all of the states around them that connect to waterways that basically connect to most of the country. So interestingly enough, at around that time, there was the American Fishery Society got together and put together a conference resolution that said maybe, just maybe, we should start thinking about how smart it is to allow certain states to be able to introduce fish and stock them in open waters when that, if that state has waterways that connect to its neighboring states. Maybe if Arkansas wants to do something that's going to affect Louisiana, Louisiana should have a say. But the interesting thing about Arkansas, given its connections to all of those local waterways, was that if they had followed that advice, Arkansas would have need to have gotten the advice of basically all of the, the south and all of the states that are connected to the Mississippi River all the way into the Great Lakes. And they never would have agreed to this. But this was the kind of concern that we didn't really spend a lot of time worried, being worried about in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. So where does this put us now? Well, from a Great Lakes point of view, which was initially how I got into working on this story, we're worried about how, how large they grow and how often they spawn and how quickly they spread in these impacts on native species that they might have in the destruction of wetlands. As I mentioned, in terms of how big they grow, it, it's typical for these fish to reach about 40 to 50 to 60 pounds. I spent some time with some fishermen on the Illinois River uh, and was presented with a big head carp that weighed about 50 pounds. And I remember when it was handed to me and I asked the man I was out with, was like, how much does that one weigh? And he was like, see for yourself. And he was about the size of a linebacker and he, he handed it to me. And I remember having to like, you know, bend my knees. It was like a barbell and just to be able to pick this thing up because the boat I was in had um, about a three foot tall slat. You had to throw the fish over um, with all of the ones that we were catching. And this one, I was horrified to find out. It was like this 50 pound monster that was from about like here down to the ground. Um, it was about typical. That's, you, you see those in some parts of the Illinois and the Mississippi River with more regularity than you would like. Historically, we have known them to grow to 140 odd pounds. That's not typical, but it's possible. When we were worried initially about the Great Lakes as well, we were also thinking to ourselves, well, 
maybe they wouldn't be able to survive in the, wa the waters there, or maybe they're too cold. Well, the Great Lakes are cold, but if they're nor native range in China and Russia, the waterways that they were encountering there were just as cold as they were in Canada and in the Great Lakes states. Initially, we thought that uh, in terms of the river length that they would need to spawn, the way that they work is that they will head further upriver, and they need to find a waterway that is moving at a fast enough speed that when they lay their eggs that they will stay buoyant for approximately three days. Um, so that, because if the, so they need to find these very specific river circumstances. If it's moving too quickly, the eggs will be washed out into a larger water body where they won't survive. But if the water is moving too slow, they will basically settle down in the sediment and they won't survive that way either. So there needed to be this Goldilocks sort of situation. And so initially we thought, well, maybe they won't find that. But the Great Lakes being these massive waterways, they have so many different tributary rivers and streams that yes, we not only were they able to find the rivers that they would need to spawn, but actually there are far more of them we thought. Maybe they won't be able to find enough food was another argument. But the thing that makes Asia, um, specifically big head and silver carp as terrifying as they are is not that they, they prey on native fish species, but that they eat their lunch. Because they are filter feeders and they're, because they are able to consume upwards of 20% of their body weight every single day, which when you're a 50 pound fish is a lot of phyto and zooplankton, these microscopic plants and insects and animals that you would need to survive, you need to eat to survive. It means that they're just taking out huge volumes of food that native fish are going to be relying on at some point in their lives. With grass carp is where we get worried about wetlands. Anecdotally, there were stories that came out of the research I was doing that would show when grass carp were overstocked and there was nothing left in the waterway to eat. If you're starving, you get desperate. And the same thing applies to fish. And so in, some, in Arkansas, in some of those early rivers and streams that they stocked with grass carp, if too many were put in the waterway, the fish actually would look out of the water and they would see shoreline plants. And there were these terrifying stories of the fish actually leaping out of the water to grab onto shoreline plants and then drag those back into the water in order to be able to avoid starvation. So when they're overstocked, when there is nothing controlling their population size, they would decimate wetlands. And the thing is, we don't really need that competition. I'm not sure but down here in Southern California, but in the Great Lakes region, uh, we do a terrific job already of destroying wetlands. In Southern Ontario, we have about 25 to 30% of the wetlands that we historically had, so we don't really need that competition, especially considering the about $70 billion worth of ecosystem services that wetlands provide for us in terms of storing flood water and cleaning our drinking water. As far as the impact on native species in the Great Lakes, it's hard to be able to say specifically what those will be, but we come back to the same idea. If you have grass carp, which are destroying wetlands, which serve as homes for a lot of juvenile fish, and if you have big head and silvers that are eating all of the food available, it would be impossible for there not to be these kinds of impacts on native species. So this is what we project one year uh, after Asian carp arrive is what the Great Lakes would look like. Um, the largest entry point would be through the Chicago River, which is why you find that like Michigan is going to be as affected as it would be in year one. And then this is year 20. What protects Lake Superior is the fact that the water, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Great Lakes watershed, the water here is actually flowing into Lake Superior and then makes its way down. These are two separate Great Lakes, but they effectively act as one water body because they're so connected. The water will make its way through, and then it's going through Lake St. Clair into Lake Erie, going over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, and then heading up the St. Lawrence River and into the Atlantic Ocean. What's protecting Lake Ontario? Uh, largely Niagara Falls in a lot of ways. A lot of things don't necessarily survive the plunge. Plus there's also a lot of hydroelectric capacity in that area. So any fish that are making their way through uh, aren't surviving the, the turbines. But for anyone you know, who's looking at this and thinking, well actually, you know, it used to be really bad in Lake Michigan and now it's looking better over here. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a short-sighted view in a lot of ways. Um, and a lot of people who were then thinking, well, yeah, but you know, the reality is that the fish aren't going to stay in the middle of these lakes where it's really cold. Where are they going to go? Well, where are the shallowest areas? And this is the areas after year one and after 20 years, areas like Green Bay that are going to be the hardest hit. Michigan, understandably, given their uh, being surrounded by the Great Lakes, are actually one of the most like vocal critics of anyone 
who attempts to be able to delay funding on dealing with the Asian carp problem. They feel this acutely. So just a little bit about this before I can open it up for questions. Um, as I say, it was about five years of researching and writing to be able to pull this together. There was 12 states and provinces that I was visiting. It was about eight dozen interviews. As I mentioned earlier, like my background as a journalist meant that I had to really ask myself what it was that I was going to bring to this story. And so as I mentioned, it was the writing for the census. I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a scientist or biologist. I, so I knew that I just had to go out and talk to a lot of them. I had to be there and to experience all of this to be able to really get a sense of how the fish was having the effects that it was. So it was archival documents. It was academic articles, newspapers. There was also a wide variety of places. So I did some phone interviews, but also you know I was in marshes and canoes, fish processing plants, laboratories, bars, cafes, restaurants. Here I'm in a lab. This is a lab that I was at in South Bend at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, where they are doing research on environmental DNA as a method for detecting Asian carp's presence in local waterways. So there's a whole chapter in the book later on that looks at how the modern panic over Asian carp started, and it actually started in these labs when you had the Army Corps of Engineers telling the public that the, Illinois, or the Chicago River had no traces of Asian carp in it. And then there was a group of scientists who were basically having lunch one day, trying to, like, hearing about this, thinking there's got to be something we can do to, see, you know, to solve this problem. So they got a geneticist friend to get involved in this, and they went and took some routine water samples, and they came back, and they tested them, and they found that they did, and they, in the process, developed a whole new way of using um, our DNA from the environment. So you don't actually have the DNA of the fish itself, but you'll take a water sample. And then if you have the DNA of Asian carp, you can look for examples to be able to see whether the fish has, is present in a genetic way in the water body. Doesn't sound so controversial, but at the time it caused an uproar, which is talk about later on in the book. But this all happened basically over lunch. Three people who were having a beer and pizza and tried to figure out what can we do about this? And they took it into the lab, and it changed the course of history with regards to Asian carp. So remember I mentioned that I was down at Mike Freeze's plant in uh, fish processing plant in Arkansas, in uh, Keogh. These are the raceways that they were using. So remember I mentioned that they got so good at grow, uh, growing Asian carp and spawning them in lab that these are the raceways that they would use. Um, and they, these got so full to bursting with these fish, that it was spaces like this that were overflowing, that were like heading into these drainage pipes that were basically emptying out into like local waterways. The interesting thing about a space like Mike Freeze's actually is that while we never found another use for big head and silver carp, grass carp actually still is legal for use in dozens of states around the country, provided that it is, uh, uh, for, uh, provided that it is sterile. And so there is now a whole way of being able to alter the chromosomes of grass carp in order to ensure that instead of having two sets, they have three, which makes them functionally sterile. They are certified by Fish and Wildlife Service and sold to whoever wants to use them. And these are the kinds of spaces that that work is done in. It's one of these interesting things that it goes from being incredibly high tech to incredibly low tech because you have spaces like this and some of the spawning sheds where uh, in order to be able to actually produce the fish together, you're basically picking up a female fish and you're pressing on her abdomen so she releases the eggs, and then you throw her in one tank, and then you go and pick up a male and hold those over the same bucket that you're using and then press their abdomen to be able to reduce or produce the, the milk that you need. And then it's basically just a Tupperware container that you mix the fish eggs and milk together, and then you put them in containers like this. And these are McDonald's hatching jars. And so these are fish eggs that you can see. They're dyed here uh, pink. Um, it's iodine that actually turns the fish eggs this, this pink color um, in order to be able to like, kill bacteria or viruses that might be uh, in the environment. From here, the fish eggs will stay in these jars for several days before they go into big vats, maybe about four feet off the ground, where the fish will stay for several weeks before they get transferred out into these big ponds, where they then will live to a size before they can be sold to anyone who needs them. And it's the exact same process that's been in place since the early 1980s. This is a hunk of smoked silver carp. Um, so as I remember, as I mentioned earlier, it is edible. I've eaten it four different ways. People often want to talk 
on the book tour I've done about how, uh, but whether we can eat them as a way to solve the problem. Um, as I was mentioning over dinner, it's actually one of the areas of the book that I was um, interested in the least, simply because the reason why we don't eat them is nothing really with uh, the bones, although that doesn't really help. It's just market forces. Um, the reality is, is that you have you have to pay people to go out and catch them if you're going to have a product that like you can or a raw material that you can turn into a product. And fishermen need to be paid between 75 cents to a dollar per pound to make it worth their while, and they're currently paid a dime. So if you were a commercial fisherman who was having to accept doing this uh, for so little money, you just wouldn't do it. And so we don't really. Um, but the, it's a very versatile fish. Um, at the plant that I visited in Thompson, Illinois, um, I, pre I was uh, presented it here smoked. Um, I've also had it in like carp burgers with like panko breadcrumbs. Uh, it's also been mixed with pumpkin and turned into little sliders. I've had it deep fried with uh, like a butter sauce over top of it. It tastes like whatever it is that you want to flavor it with. People turn these into corn dogs, but they'll also create these like expensive fillets that they will charge $60 for a side of Asian carp. It can go like haute cuisine or it can go carnival corn dog. They're incredibly versatile. Really the issue, it comes down to taste buds and preferences. We don't like bony fish as a rule in North America and because these fish are incredibly bony and very difficult to process and because there's still a stigma attached to eating carp, which has largely been seen as a trash fish for decades, uh, nothing's ever materialized. This is the jaws uh, of black carp. So you remember I mentioned that they were the fourth of those species that is on their way in. Um, the fascinating thing about black carp is that they're going to be eating the, 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 the mussels, but the fascinating thing about them is that they came in in the early 1980s. It was often told to me that if I had the opportunity to write a 10th anniversary edition of Overrun, that I was going to be focusing on black carp for the damages that they do. But they have an incredibly powerful set of jaws that allows them to be able to break apart the shells of any clams and mollusks that they find. Or when they're really big, they actually just swallow them whole and let their stomach acid dive, uh, dissolve the outer shells. This is my arm after spending a day uh, with commercial fishermen. I got so covered in blood and guts um, that it basically looks like I'm a very freckly person, which I am, but not that much. So uh, I had a hat and a jacket that I wore that day that just stank too much for me to keep afterwards. And I remember my wife telling me, she's like, you, those things are disgusting. You have to get rid of them. And so they're gone now because after washing them several times, that smell didn't come out. But those are the kinds of details that I wanted to write about. And I'm going to wrap up here really quickly by talking about something from the conclusion of the book. Um, the climate crisis, watershed degradation, big agriculture, urban sprawl. What do these unrelated issues, seemingly unrelated and intractable problems, have to do with the spread of Asian carp? And the answer is, is a lot. And this is what I want to leave you with. Across the Midwest and in the Great Lakes, the climate crisis in particular is really manifesting as uh, these increase in these violent storms that we would have. And so in the Great Lakes region, we will have 40% of our annual precipitation fall within like two days. Well, when that water falls, where does it go? So in a lot of ways, it was like if it's falling on our cities, our cities are now like, uh, like they have no permeable surfaces really anymore by and large. And so it's falling on cities often which many like Chicago and Toronto, which have combined sewer overflows that basically take just raw sewage and rainwater and ferry it into local waterways. That rain is also falling on agricultural fields that have a legacy problem with nitrogen and phosphorus. And so it will take all of the topsoil and all of the fertilizer that's been put there to be able to grow crops and it will dump it into local waterways. And what have we done with those waterways? Well, we've degraded them terribly. We've channelized them, we've removed wetlands, we've made them deeper, faster, and shorter in a lot of ways. But what is the net effect of all of those things? Well, it creates the perfect storm, the absolute perfect storm for Asian carp. Because all of that rain that it dumps all of that fertilizer into the local waterways, that fertilizer then creates all of the food that they need to eat. Asian carp also take fast moving waters as a spawning cue. And so what we've been seeing is, it's like, it wasn't that long ago in the Mississippi River where 97% of the river's biomass was Asian carp. 97% of every living thing in the waterway was Asian carp. And part of the reason why is because for so long we've thought we can deploy scientific solutions to this problem or we can pay commercial fishermen. But at the same time, the point that I want to leave everyone with is that if we, start, if we continue to think about these things in silos, we will never be able to get a, a grip on the Asian carp crisis that's unfolding simply because the climate crisis 
is fueling the spread of Asian carp in all of these ways. And so if we want to be able to get a handle on this, we need to think about how we build our cities and how we grow our food and what we've done to our waterways. And the argument I make is that if we turn around and improve the quality of our water and how we grow food and how we build our cities, even if it doesn't actually do anything to solve the carp crisis, the end result is a more sustainable food system, healthier cities, and healthier waterways. And so even if we lose, in another sense, we still win. Thanks very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Who has a question? Raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. So, all right, we got one right here. Uh, so I didn't read your book or anything yet, <laughs> um, but I don't know if you've touched on this. As far as eating goes, in your yeah. experience, do you think rebranding the fish would do anything, such as like what we've done with Patagonian toothfish? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is a celebrity chef in Louisiana, Philippe Parola, who has gotten a patent uh, over many years of work on, a, on Asian carp. Um, specifically, he is calling them silverfin. And his idea was, it just has a problem with branding. There's no such thing as a trash fish. We also have a problem with um, like food deserts here. So his idea was you have this opportunity as well with a lot of large institutions that have people that they need to feed. Cruise ships, prisons, hospitals. Um, you have, so his thought was places where you have a lot of people who need protein, it was like where you want to do it on the cheap, maybe there's this opportunity to be able to feed them with the fish. And then maybe it was really just an issue with the name. Um, the reality is this was a number of years ago that he got that patent. Some things are moving forward, but it comes back to the same sort of issue as I mentioned. If you're not paying commercial fishermen enough to be able to go out and catch them, then you don't have that raw material. The other problem we've encountered is we can only really guess at the volume of fish in the water. So if you go to a bank and say, I want to open a fish processing plant and I'm going to be pulling Asian carp out of the Illinois River, and they're going to say, okay, well, you want $10 million to open this plant, but how many fish are in the river? Like, are, is, there, is your product going to run out in a year or two years? And we don't know. And then the whole other side to that is that biologists will say that building an industry around a fish that the government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to eradicate or control is not necessarily the most sustainable way to go about it. So we've approached eating them from every which way. We do. Uh, we feed them to pets as well, but it's, it's been incredibly small scale. Uh, there are people who are working on this problem now, but it has not, uh, it has not proven as effective as we thought it would be. Back in the back. I learned quite a bit, um, and I want to thank you very much. I'm really intrigued about how they ate food that was quite not too healthy, mm -hmm. and it didn't affect them. And then their, they were, their, um, their, if you eat their, ate them, you didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. Do they have their own autoimmune system or in the course of them digesting this type of food that they develop an autoimmune system? The reason I'm bringing this up is I see quite a people that are homeless or digging in the trash, eating trash. And I'm wondering if have they studied them or considering to study them to find out how they were able to stay alive and still have help be healthy, perhaps that could help mankind in the future because unfortunately, when you look at what's going on, there's more and more people becoming homeless and don't have healthy food. It's a good question. Um, I'll say right off the top, I'm not sure with regards to like their, their physiology, whether there is something unique to them that would make them be able to survive on nothing but human waste with, and, and still be healthy for people to eat. Unfortunately, for Scott Henderson, who was doing that study, it was a much smaller subset of the research he was doing. It was almost really done as a side issue. I think that he, he and others probably would have wanted to explore that more if the whole thing hadn't been shut down. Interestingly enough, though, other people sort of had taken up this idea, which is we have a lot of people who are um, food insecure in a lot of ways. And Illinois, about a decade ago, partnered with a group um, called like Illinois, it was like uh, it was Hunters Against Hunger, something like that. I know that that's not the name of the program, but in either case, 
About a decade ago, Illinois partnered with hunters who were killing deer, but who had too much, who were partnering with local food banks to be able to give them some of that venison because often protein was one of the hardest things to come by for people who had food insecurity. And so they decided to try the same program with Asian carp. It was if you were an angler who was going out or a fisherman who was hauling them in, uh, the state for a few years started sponsoring the processing of Asian carp and giving it out to local food banks to be able to make sure that people who needed it had access to a, a, an affordable and healthy protein option. The challenge was, was that it was incredibly successful um, over a number of years, but the state really did it as almost like a demonstration. And their hope was that someone in the NGO sphere or the private sector was going to take that up and run with it. And unfortunately for all of the market dynamic forces that I just mentioned, it never really happened. There's also a stigma uh, in a lot of government circles in the United States about subsidies. Uh, and so for a very long time, it was sort of viewed as the government didn't want to step in and say, hey, if you're interested in processing these fish and feeding them to people who need it, we'll help you to the tune of X amount of dollars to help get this off the ground. Those kinds of programs tend to be very difficult to sell to the public, and so they never really took off in the way that they could have. Uh, it's starting to change a little bit now, but not fast enough, which is why one of the other conclusions in the book I draw is that we can talk about scientific solutions and hydrologic separation, but the single most effective way we have come up with to date of stopping Asian carp is actually just paying commercial fishermen to go out and catch them. And all that happens with those millions of pounds of fish is they're turned into fertilizer. Well, with a little bit more money, they could be turned into food for people who need it. All right, we're going to call in tonight because a lot of you have a school tomorrow. And <laughs> uh, Andrew is going to be in the, in the gift shop. So if anybody wants to buy a book, he will autograph it. And if you have a question over there, you come on up and we'll deal with it here. But thank you all for coming. Appreciate it very much. Thanks so much. Well done.